Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. And I am honored to introduce my colleague and wonderful artist, Jennifer Williams, Jen Williams. And I also feel extremely honored to introduce her in the context of being our 20 hour meeting within the context of the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art 2020 Fall Wolf Chair. Uh, Jen Williams uh, earned her MFA from Goldsmith College in London. She's represented by Robert Mann Gallery in New York. Her work has been widely exhibited throughout the country, including the Akron Art Museum, San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art, Pittsburgh Center for the Arts, and Queens Museum, among others. She has had public art projects um, at Dumbo Arts Festival, UMass Amherst, um, the Moss Art Center at Virginia Tech, to name a few. Uh, she has also uh, received the Pollock Krasner grant in photography. And before joining the Cooper Union uh, as an adjunct professor and head of photography technician, uh, Jennifer Williams was a visiting professor at Brown University. And thank you so much for joining us. And I also look forward to hearing from Jen more about her work and her practice and the way in which she thinks about photography and the, the structures of photography. So just a little information for everyone who's joining us. So the talk will be between 40, 45 minutes and questions can, there's a, a box in the Zoom for questions. And please feel free to put in questions even during the lecture, but please note that we won't, that Jen will not answer them until the end of the lecture. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Professor Williams. Um, thank you, Leslie. And, um, and I wanted to say thank you to the full-time faculty, the Dean and the Associate Dean for inviting me uh, to be the Wolf Chair this year in photography. Um, I also wanted to thank Professor Christina Sinsky, who um, has recently retired, but um, just for bringing me back to Cooper. You know, I'm an alumni and I came back to, to teach later and work there um, and all the support and mentorship she's given me over the years. Um, also, just to thank you know everybody at Cooper that's helped me over time, whether it be faculty or staff, um, and and the friends that I've made there who continue to be a source of inspiration and uh, they give really good constructive criticism. Um, and thank you to everybody who's out there somewhere in Zoom land who who tuned in tonight to to hear me talk about my work. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, most of the talk is going to sort of focus on the work I make about cities, um, but since this is also for the Cooper community and I'm an alumni, I thought I'd kind of go back into some of my inspirations and, and you can kind of see the trajectory of where things came from. And then I'll do a little tiny bit at the end about another um, not city-based work that, um, but is also sort of a site-specific sort of thing and it's about photography too. So. Um, okay, so the first piece, this is the one that was in all of the posters and um, this is a part of a new series that I'm doing. So I'm just gonna show you a couple things from now and then kind of dive back and then work my way back up to today. So this is from a series called New York City of Tomorrow, which um, began at the Queens Museum. Um, part of this collage at the bottom is uh, an image taken from the panorama of the city of New York, which is a model of the city um, that was last updated in 1992. And um, it's juxtaposed with, this was uh, made in 2016. So this is um, downtown New York City circa uh, 2016. So um, I'll talk more about this later. Uh, this is the same collage made sort of smaller that was placed back into that space and then re-photographed next to some of the things that are in it. So it's kind of gone through a lot of um, revolution and um, 
this was, I'm trying to put together a, what was a book, but it's, it's become something else of this project, which I'll talk about later as well. Um, a lot of, and actually most of the city-based work that I do in towns has to do with where the space is that I'm exhibiting. So this is Robert Mann Gallery, which was in Chelsea on 26th Street. Um, this project was titled The Highline Effect. And so the, um, the collages here are, are images that were taken outside of the gallery of the, the spaces immediately outside of the gallery. And the Highline itself is this elevated park that sort of cuts through a city block and it sort of lifts you away from everything that's going uh, on down in the street. So again, more later. Um, and this is, this was in Newburgh. These are some of the other places that I've been asked to do projects in. Um, sometimes things are inside the gallery, sometimes they're outside. So this was a public project. Um, and this was the one at the Moss Art Center at Virginia Tech. Um, it juxtaposes the actual town of Blacksburg, which with the campus. And so these are these are the things that I'm doing now. And um, lastly, this is just a quick image of um, something not about a city. It's it's ladders, and um, we'll talk about how. I mean, these aren't real ladders; they're actually photographs of ladders, and um, how they fill the space. So. Um, just going back to the beginning, uh, a lot of my work is about walking and uh, taking pictures while walking, kind of gathering what's around me and then taking that um, back with me into the studio and turning it into a representation of that walking. And so I was kind of curious, I went back through my negatives to find when this started and it was actually before I went to Cooper. Um, I grew up in a, a semi-rural part of the Rust Belt outside of Pittsburgh and um, there were, this is just a segment of a mill that my grandfather worked at. So um, I did the whole thing, but then, you know, I'm walking along, I'm taking these pictures, I'm kind of gathering what's there. And at the time, um, you know, I, I didn't grow up with photography, I got a camera when I was in high school to take some art classes. And um, I was really shooting these images as sort of a keepsake of, of my past. So I, I wasn't seeing it as forms and shapes uh, the way that I do now looking at it, however many years later. Um, it really was just, I was trying to figure out a way to take this, this thing that was bigger than I could take one single photograph of and, and bring it with me so that I had a record of it. Um, other things that when I was in high school, I was able to take these classes in Pittsburgh. So I lived, you know, 35 minutes away, but I, I took Saturday classes. Um, there are some really great spaces in Pittsburgh that show art. So the Mattress Factory and the Carnegie Muse Museum of Art being two of them. Um, so I just, I found two pieces that I really uh, remember seeing and that I think have sort of influenced me much later. This is a James Terrell, it's called Varda. And, um, you know, anybody who's seen a James Terrell in person knows that, that it's, it's really hard to understand what is going on when you're like in the space with it. It's sort of, there are these glowing things and they seem to just sort of exist within a wall. So I remember spending a really long time looking at it and trying to figure out um, how it was made. And the second was this Bill Viola piece called The Sleep of Reason. And it was a room, it had this furniture in it. And what would happen is as you were standing there, there would suddenly be these projections and sound of there was fire and there was walking through uh, the forest and all these very dreamlike things. But it was this immersive experience that it wasn't, you know, a sculpture, it wasn't built, it was projected, but it was on the four walls and you just sort of fell into it. And then suddenly it was gone and it was back to this sort of white space again. And so, you know, looking back, I, I can see those really influencing what I did now, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, but when I got to Cooper, like a lot of people, I was doing all kinds of things. I was drawing and painting, which was bad. I was making sculptures, I was making films. This was a drawing I dug out from somewhere. But I was, 
I'm adding this because I was trying to make things that were very large. And so this is still referencing that sort of industrial landscape that I grew up in. It doesn't have anything to do with New York yet. Um, this was maybe 36 inches high and maybe six feet wide. And then um, this sculpture, which is also this sort of industrial thing that is made up of pieces. It's actually modular, they come apart. Um, it was the biggest thing. It was as tall as the lobby and the foundation building it was the biggest thing I could make. Um, and it's actually the last sculpture I ever made before I realized I just liked building things and it didn't have to be sculpture. I, I think one of the things that kind of led to that revelation and kind of took me back into photography um, was seeing two, two shows in my junior year one was of the Bechers, um, their blast furnaces and their typologies, which for me, you know, coming from this place where this stuff was, I mean, these photographs actually were taken in Ohio and these next ones were in Pennsylvania. Um, these are things I was familiar with. I, they, I saw them driving around, but I'd never seen them shown as these formal sculptural objects, um, you know, photographed this way. So it took it from that sort of nostalgia into this very, like I say, sculptural or art um, oriented formal space. And then the next thing uh, was I went on exchange to England through Cooper and there was a Gordon Mata Clark retrospective at the Serpentine. And again, I'd never seen this kind of work before. Um, you know, I, I liked photography because I was able to kind of gather everything and I didn't have to spend time drawing it. Um, of course, there's you know, time that you spent in the dark room, but this wasn't photography in a way that I'd seen before. It was, you know, A, it's sort of like him making these sculptural cuts through buildings, which is, you know, a huge gesture. And then the documentation of that which again was something um, constructed. It was it was put together, and um, you know it was supposed to be this sort of representation of of how you were encountering the space, as opposed to the sort of static documentation of the space or a performance. And in the show, there were there were videos, there was films, um, you know, actual slices of buildings and things, and so. This really changed the way that I thought about photography. When I came back to Cooper after being in England, um, you know, we had just gotten a color processor. It was kind of this big new thing at school. This is 1993, I think. And the work changed. I, I wasn't making sculptures anymore. I wasn't making drawings anymore. I was constructing photographs. So I was also kind of, uh, engaging with New York in a way I hadn't before. Whereas, you know, you come from somewhere, you kind of harken back to it. And now I was seeing everything with new eyes. Um, this was the first apartment I'd ever been in that had a bathtub in the kitchen. And so that was just, I, you know, I was trying to understand that. And then I could print much faster with color prints. I could print bigger. Um, and then I started to construct these spaces. Um, so the work sort of went there. This, some of these I think were from my senior show and um, there were others of other people's spaces. And then I started taking pictures of my own space because that was the easiest thing to kind of have at your fingertips and kind of tear apart and explore. So um, this is actually the hallway of my apartment which my apartment was very strangely laid out to begin with. But um, it's, you can see I'm not actually tearing the space apart myself, but I am tearing it apart with the way that I'm photographing it and then trying to put it together again. And then big, um, here's that drawing again from whatever sophomore year, but you know, this is a scale, this is a photograph, this is um, you know, much bigger than just like a singular image would be. And it, it, with photography, the whole like one frame, the rectangle of it, um, that always, I always wanted everything else that was outside of it. And so this is me trying to kind of create that own space for myself. So just to keep going, um, these are some things that happened after college. I didn't have time, or sorry, I didn't have access to a dark room. So I was just shooting. This is my apartment again. Um, this is the kitchen and this is the room uh, next to the kitchen. 
So um, still working with those spaces, trying to kind of, this is the connector. You can see what's going on over there. It's like this little door to Narnia. Um, just sort of deconstructing things and putting them back together again. Um, I went to Goldsmiths in the late 90s where um, again, I was oops, sorry working with these interior spaces and I started trying to put them in places that weren't the wall, um, adding some sort of you know paint to them. Um, but it still was all about this interiority. It was kind of gathering what was there. Um, these next two are sort of talking about inside and outside space and the relationship they have to each other. Um, this was on the top of a very tall building and, um, you know, making these sort of circle shapes kind of became a thing. And, you know, that's like your eye kind of peeking in, um, moving you, the viewer around the way that I want you to see things, which I think is something, you know, that I do now. And, um, again, sort of trying to take these and make them as big as I can within the limits of what I had at my fingertips. So I, I was in England for a year and I sort of went back and forth for a while. And I, I came back and then was here pretty much for the, you know, since, since then. Uh, so there was sort of a period of, uh, working and, and learning new technologies because digital was a thing that came in. Um, I was working at DS Center for the Arts during construction for a while, I was in a band. And by sort of like the mid nineties, I, I had a, bought a new camera and just started shooting again. And what happened was, you know, I was growing, I was kind of trying to learn these new things in New York, started growing in a way I hadn't seen. I, I'd moved here in 1990 and things were happening, but it, it, the, the energy of, the, of how the change really um, ramped up in, in the mid 2000s. So, you know, I was still living in the same apartment in the Lower East Side, been there for a long time. And so I was sort of watching things like this go up, these mysterious little boxes. And um, I remember one day sitting in Tompkins Square Park and just having this feeling of, you know what, you're here now, New York, New York accepts you. And so, um, something from that just sort of pushed me out to start doing things uh, with the city. So I had a whole series of these. This is another one. This is a hotel that's, that's down, I think, on Orchard Street. But um, just it just seems so absurd after a period of, uh, I was in New York for maybe, what, 15 years, and you know, things were growing, but not at the very fast. And then all of a sudden, these things started popping up. So I'm walking around taking these pictures. Um, I'm taking other pictures with the little digital camera as I go. I started making these collages and I started printing the collages and then we pasting them because I decided I didn't really know what I'd want to do with a white box of a gallery, but it made sense to kind of put things back out in the world and, and see what would happen to them. So this again pops up later, um, just last year. So there's a couple of these that I do. And you know, I'm I'm working through how to to take materials and sort of shape them again into to what I want them to be. Wheat pasting at the time was what was available, um, and this was the Dumbo Arts Festival. So after I kind of started working again, I was applying to stuff. I was um, you know got into some sort of public art things. I had a few shows in places. Um, but wheat pasting was really frustrating because it, it, you know, you could only do it once really. It seemed very wasteful. And of course it could be, you know, if you see me up there on the thing, a little dangerous to be hanging over. So a big change came in about 2009 when I discovered this material called Phototex, which they actually had at Cooper. That's how I found it. And um, this is like a wallpaper material that you can print on that uh, you can stick onto surfaces, but it comes off again. So it's something that is, uh, you know, has photo quality and you can cut it out and it's reusable and it wraps around walls and spaces and sort of melds in with the wall. And it, it kind of goes back to that James Terrell and that Bill Viola the viola pieces from from earlier like this is 
this theme where it just sort of melds into what's there and it isn't a separate entity from the space. And I like the idea of sort of activating places in a space that aren't what you normally look at. So that's another goal of the work. This is uh, Long Island City. This is the first piece that I did, I think, that was specifically neighborhood based. Like I say, 2009, if I were to do it today, uh, the, that uh, left hand side would just be an explosion of buildings because it's, it's so crazy there now. But um, this material allowed for these collages to now come alive in a new way. So um, this was part of a series that I think this was like 2013. It was about the Bowery. It was at La Mama. And um, the bottom are sort of archival photos that I took from over the years and then how it kind of grew. I mean, in this one in particular, seeing the Hewitt building turn into the, the new building and things like that. But anyway, um, you know, contents and then also just the presentations. So, you know, this is depending on the lighting, you know, this sort of looks like it's popping out at you and actually it is a flat thing on the wall. So this ability, you know, that photography gives you to kind of like create these, these things that look real, but they're fake um, is something that I really like playing with within the collages. And um, this is not city-based, but it's just a really good representation of it. This was at uh, the Hunterton Art Museum in uh, New Jersey. And it was an old building that used to be uh, a flour mill in the 1800s. And so there were these chutes that went up and down between the floors. And this is the actual, this is the elevator shaft. So um, showing those forms and then, you know, none of these things are actually holes. That's, that's just the way that the photograph rendered space when it was placed on the floor. Um, and then having, like I said, you could use this material in other places too. So um, the material itself is reusable, which is very exciting and modular. So going back to that sculpture that I made a million years ago with pieces, you can take it apart, send it somewhere, give someone instructions, and then you know they can marginally put it together. And so these next few are just uh, uh, one particular piece that's sort of traveled around a bit and you can see how it interacts with space. This was Gowanus and Fourth Avenue in Park Slope um, and sort of how, you know, Gowanus is very small and then Fourth Avenue has gotten insane. Um, this originally was shown here at 440 Gallery, which is in Park Slope. So that's where it came from. And then this was at NIFA in Brooklyn later. So um, space, playing with space, um, being able to take a form and mold it to a space. Um, those are things that I think are very interesting. And then how the, the photographs themselves sort of play with you. I mean, unfortunately, you know, we're stuck on Zoom here. We can't walk up to something and look at it, which is like a huge part of the work is being in the space and actually seeing it from a distance or seeing a close up. Um, this series, which I showed a little bit earlier, the Highline Effects at Robert Mann was sort of um, a point where I think contents in, and materials sort of meshed really well. Um, there are four pieces and each one highlights a section of the High Line where you would either enter from the street to the, the actual park or you know, go down the stairs from the park either way. So it's sort of set up in these sections to um, uh, replicate the experience that you would have as you were walking um, either underneath or on top. So this is, um, and you know, there's other things like there's this Joseph Boyce piece, the 7,000 Oaks, which are just the rocks that are placed along, what is it, 22nd Street, 21st Street, in front of Dia. Um, and this goes down to the viewing platform. And then um, this one's a little upside down, the, the high lines on the bottom, but you're sort of walking underneath the standard hotel and then you're kind of spit out into uh, the West Village and the Whitney is there. And like I said, this was 2014. This was before the second part of the highlight was done. This was, um, you know, we're 
I go back and do it again, it would be totally different now because of what is called uh, literally the Highline effect. Um, the fact that they they made this uh, elevated park, and once they made the park, the whole neighborhood exploded in gentrification, and they weren't expecting it. Um, after this show, I had a few asks to do pieces in other cities or towns. I did one in Detroit, and um, we'll go back to this one at Virginia Tech, um, which was really interesting to kind of work on. So I, I got to go, they invited me to, to have a talk with a historian and um, walk around the town and to sort of learn about, and, and with all of these projects, I'm sort of learning about the history of the place and the zoning laws and all of those things ahead of time, like they're sort of built into it. Um, and with this, at some point in the 1700s, there it was a parcel of land, it was separated to two brothers and then um, it became what it is today. So one half became a grid like a city, and then the other half became uh, a land grant uh, university, which turned into Virginia Tech. So um, these are in this hallway, which linked the, the gallery below to the gallery above, and um, the Moss Art Center has an auditorium and a lot of other things in it. So it was very public. Everybody that walked by at any time could see it. And um, the entirety of the campus and the town was represented. So um, there are layers and layers going on there, sort of weaving under each other. I think each side had about 80 pieces. It took four days to install. Um, and oh, another thing I wanted to mention was originally with all of these things is they've gotten bigger and they've turned into sort of more public facing spaces, um, you know, I wanted it to go on the ceiling and the floor, but the fire code wouldn't allow it. So sometimes there are these limitations you have to work within and um, it doesn't allow you to be quite as explosive and expressive as you might want to be. Um, okay. And with the, the town, the sort of further away you go, the older the architecture is and the, the closer to the university, the, the newer it becomes. So it was really fun to have people come and look at things and, and tell me everything they knew about every building. Um, back to Newburgh. So this, um, again, this was uh, uh, this organization called Strong Room that approached me about doing a piece on this wall. And um, I'm just gonna show you this video. Yes. Um, again, this came with limitations and it was a big challenge. Uh, first of all, you know, what was it going to be? Um, learning some of the history of Newburgh, driving around, uh, talking to people. It's the piece itself became the, the entirety of Liberty Street, which is the longest and one of the oldest streets in Newburgh. Um, it sort of encompasses uh, all kinds of architecture and kind of a lot of the different trends or things that kind of came through and some of the disuse and then the sort of gentrifying bits. And anyway, it, it sort of encompassed a lot of what the town was about. So there was a lot of back and forth, like if you build something, you need a permit. Um, the design itself had to go through a committee. And then if it was just gonna stick to the wall, how would we do that? Um, so materials, the photo text is not going to stick to brick. A lot of things aren't going to stick to brick. Um, so oops. Uh, we had to, well, I had to figure out a way to do that within our budget, which was the other thing. Uh, sorry, this is the street corner in Newburgh. You can see that there's some other murals there as well. And um, oh, and I just put this one up. This is sort of the sketch that I made and we we measured a little bit. We, we pretty much eyeballed it to try to get it up there. It took two days. Um, this is my studio. So it, interestingly, not photo text, but it was another sticky back material that was uh, more plastic and less of a weave mounted. I mounted it onto an aluminum uh, sticky backed material that is designed to go on brick. And then I coated it with uh, an overcoat of something that was a weatherproofing. Um, had we had the money, we could have gotten it commercial printed, but we didn't. So I sort of figured it out and this is my studio. Um, and this is just one tiny little panel. That's I think 
right in the middle, you can see that red building. Um, so you can kind of get an understanding of scale. So I think it's the biggest thing that I've ever made. Um, okay, so moving forward to now, uh, you know, I lived in the Lower East Side for 23 years. Uh, Manhattan was a huge inspiration for a lot of the work that I made. Uh, then we got kicked out, I moved to Queens and um, Queens has been really pretty kind to me. So this is the panorama of the city of New York, which is a model of the five boroughs that was made for the World's Fair. And it was last updated in 1992. So this ginormous thing is this, this sort of archive of the city, this 3D archive of the city, not just a map, but an actual, um, you know, living, well, not living, but it, it is uh, 3D of the city. And um, you can see in this picture, there's, I think, a school group here kind of peering over at it. So you're allowed to kind of walk around the edge of it and look down and get a sense of, of the city from above as if you were in an airplane. Um, so for the Queens International, they um, generously gave me the space to work with. And I had really grand plans, again, came down to money and also logistics. Um, you can't actually walk on the panorama unless you weigh something very small, like 150 pounds. So um, if I wanted to put something down there, I couldn't do it myself. And then I did, you know, I was able to put something high up here on the one side, on the right side, but on the other sides, it was too difficult to get the, the lift over there and, and I don't know, there were a lot of things. Anyway, it ended up being that I could do one really large piece and then these other smaller pieces on the sides. So I was happy with that and that became the beginning of something much larger. So this is 57th Street. Um, again, the bottom is taken from the, the panorama itself um, and then uh, the 57th Street now, how it's been growing. This is from 2016, so again, it would be even different now. Um, this is Long Island City. So uh, 2016, if you look back at that 2009 piece, um, it's a little hard to tell, but you can see that there's like a lot more buildings going on there. And um, this is downtown Brooklyn. So each one of them was placed, this doesn't have the model on it, but it was placed next to the portion of the city as close as I could get it to. So you could you know, be looking at the live model, then looking at the representation of the model and then see um, what had changed since the model itself had been updated. Um, I originally had planned for eight neighborhoods. And so I continued the project afterwards. This was actually at Cooper. This is the Bowery. And um, it is in the, the new ga the gallery in the new building. So I was really excited to work with that space. I'd wanted to do something on that wall forever. Um, so this was, uh, again, even since the project I did at the Bowery, which I think was 2013, a lot of things had happened since then. Um, we're back to, this is downtown, um, the financial district at the foundation center. So all of these are now placed in spaces that are where the portion of the model was taken from. So the first ones were like in the model itself. And these are now, you know, the, the, the previous one at Cooper that was of the Bowery. This is installed downtown. This is installed in Williamsburg. So this was a, a, a gallery space that was actually in somebody's home in Williamsburg. Um, and then COVID hit and I sort of ran out of the ability to put things indoors or even go outside. So I had gotten this grant from the Pollock Krasner Foundation to finish this project and then create a book or some sort of documentation of it. So I was kind of scurrying around trying to finish up um, while you know, we weren't actually able to go out anywhere. Um, this is Hudson Yards and this is just in my studio, but it's the beginning of things starting to come off the wall and become more three-dimensional. So I kind of, sometimes I make these really strict rules for myself where everything has to be this or that or have this or that. And so I, some of this has sort of forced me to, to push outside those boundaries. And um, like I say, this, one of the points of um, 
the grant when I had applied for it was that I was going to take all of this and turn it into some sort of book or some kind of documentation of it. And so I realized to do that, I mean, it's a huge thing. Like a book is like an exhibition. So I needed further explanation of what was going on. And so I started putting these outside again, just like those collages that I did way back in the day um, uh, in the Lower East Side, just going, placing something there, taking a picture of it. So um, people that aren't from New York, or even if you are from New York and you don't know where some of these neighborhoods are, you have a sense of what I'm talking about um, beyond just the art that I've made. Um, now it's this sort of almost living thing within the landscape and having a relationship to, to what was shot. So again, 57th Street, um, ooh, sorry, go back, oh, Long Island City. Um, this is downtown Brooklyn, um, Bowery. Um, that's the financial district again. And Williamsburg and Hudson Yards. And this is, again, last picture I took before we had the lockdown. Um, but this is Willits Point Station, and then that's Flushing. So this is what happened instead of a book, because a book seemed way too, I don't know, not as interactive, I suppose, as the art itself is that each piece has become some kind of poster that is then going to be in, put together in a collection. So, I mean, there was so much kind of looking around, trying to figure out how to, to make a structure, to put this in, to really be true to the work itself. And um, this is sort of what happened in the end. Wait, where's the next one? Go, there we go. Um, and this is just me fiddling with it so that you can see what happens. So there's, at the moment, there's these two kinds of posters and both sides interact with each other. And, and what was really exciting about this was, again, moving out of a certain realm, taking the images, turning them into something else, making them hand holdable and trying to retain some, some shred of what it's like when you walk in and you see one of these in a space. So, and then they're going to go into a thing which is also fold outable that just gives you a small kind of very close up view of, of what one of the um, wall pieces would be. So um, you're able to sort of experience as if you were from a distance or you can experience as if you were standing right in front of it, which I think is really great. And then you can put them all together. Anyway, it's a totally new way of working for me that it's, you know, it's a white box, again, like a gallery, but it's um, hand holdable and it's also portable and it can go anywhere and you don't have to walk into a gallery to be able to experience it. Um, okay, so just to finish up, I have a few images from this latter series and what I'll say about this is that I had a conversation with a curator once who told me I needed something that wasn't so site responsive. I needed something I could just pull out of my box um, to be in a show anywhere and be very adaptable. And I sort of understood because uh, so much of the city work, it, it could take a year to, to do the research and shoot the photos and make the collages and, and get it you know, funded and all of these things and make it happen. So this came out of, um, sort of ladders popping up in a lot of the earlier work that I was making. So that's a ladder from that weed paste. Um, this is another early piece from like 2010 um, and this one as well. So what was interesting, like these ladders as an object, as a photographed object um, became these really fun kind of mind bending things. In, even in, you know, when you were walking in the space and you saw them. Once again, these are not real ladders, they're all flat. They are either stuck to the floor or they are, uh, they are double-sided foam core that's hung from the ceiling. And what I liked about them as well is 
I'm using a ladder all the time to put up all this work. I mean, all of us use ladders for various things. We don't think about them very much, but they take you from this sort of level that you're comfortable with up into spaces that, you know, when you're looking down, you see your everyday surroundings in a totally different way. And um, they're transformative. Just, just as an object and we sort of overlook them all the time. And it's different than like stairs because stairs are permanent and you go upstairs, you go downstairs, but ladders, you kind of pull out, you do a thing and you put it away. And so that's this really discreet moment that I think is interesting. So these are all, um, the first ones were at Robert Mann Gallery. This is in Philly at UCAL. Um, they've been able to travel around to a lot of places and you know, like this one is sort of bending um, to take on a sort of human form. Um, this was at the San Jose ICA, and I'm just adding this one because um, as opposed to kind of like creating things in the computer, which you can do with some of the flat work, with this, I made a model. I, I didn't actually travel there to see the space before I went, and I often make models and then photograph them with smaller versions in there just to get a sense of what's going on, and um, this is my model. Um, this is the model of Robert Mann. And sometimes it looks exactly the same, sometimes it looks different, but uh, I am not entirely sure if kind of setting things up on a computer would give you the same uh, output rather than kind of taking physical things and putting them into a tiny space and then photographing them. Okay, that is my last slide. So um, I am going to stop there and see if there are any questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jen. Um, I hope you can hear me, Jen. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I think I'm supposed to pop back into the frame, but if not, I will be a voice. Uh, so there are several questions here and um, I will start with one question that is from an anonymous attendee who was really interested in the earlier photographs that you showed of the mill mm -hmm. and how trying wanting to understand the connection between those early photographs and really what seems to be consistent in your practice, which is a conversation between three-dimensionality, the dynamics between time and uh, time-spanning constructions of space. Uh, and so I'm paraphrasing a little bit because of how it's written, but the point I think you understand is from your earlier work, like what now looking back, like what do you see in that earlier work that is a thread in your contemporary work? Um. I think it's just the, the, the idea of, of gathering and wanting to take everything that I'm seeing in front of me and, and, and represent it, and make a representation of it. So um, like I say, with the mill, it really was, uh, this is my first time walking and taking pictures of something that then could be collaged together. Um, I hadn't seen that before, you know, I, I wasn't, it wasn't like there were a million photo books and the internet was there. It was really just this impulse to go and do it because I, I wanted it all. And I couldn't do that in one image or I didn't know how. And um, so I just started walking and shooting. And like I say, we take that for granted now because of digital, we're just, we can click as many pictures as we want and there's no consequences. But then you had 36. If you didn't have another role, then you were out. So, I mean, that's the reason I just sort of went back to that because I, I almost was surprised myself to see that um, I did that. And mm -hmm. then it came back later <laughs> in another way. Um, and also, again, with the, the sort of form, formality of those forms, the sort of house shapes and, and just the, the sort of cutouts. Um, and like I say, I wasn't seeing it that way at the time, but looking back, I'm like, oh, that's, that's really interesting. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I was drawn to it because of that, but I didn't. Well, I'll tag on a little to that anonymous question, or at least just comment that I loved seeing your early work. That sculpture was beautiful and, oh, and very striking. And also obviously to see how it connects to the way in which you conceptualize space. 
Mm. Um, so there's a question, a question, and also a hello from Betsy Highstand, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing yes. your last name. <laughs> but um, so there's a retranslation from 3D to 2D and back again in your practice. Um, and so she says, I'd be interested in hearing Jen, hi Jen, <laughs> speak about the, ki the kind of illusion making that the work produces. Okay. I mean, I think it, I think it kind of goes back to that whole idea of like, I like making things and I enjoy sculpture, but I don't, I'm, I'm not gonna make sculpture myself. So instead I can photograph it and take it with me and then put it together in this kind of, yeah, like putting forward this illusion of an actual object, but, but it's not. And um, what does that mean? I mean, how, it's like, it's different than sculpture where sculpture is like the actual thing that you can see and touch. And um, whereas this is more of a translation, I guess. And I feel like painting and drawing is maybe similar. Like you're seeing something, you're you're using your hand to to recreate it. Um, and I think the the way I treat photography or the way that it ends up being shown has some of that in it, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you. Um, we have another a question from Laura Sellers who described your work as dynamic and joyous. Um, the smaller pieces become almost like crystal structures with shard-like colors. So also, I guess, analyzing and describing your work back to you. Um, have you considered doing books uh, that had also more uh, physicality in, in addition to the fold out? Um. That's that's an interesting question because one of the tasks I set for myself while being uh, in, in our lockdown situation was learning how to make pop-ups. And this is something Beverly Joel, um, who was also a professor at Cooper many, many years ago had mentioned to me. And uh, I'm just now, since I was trying to turn this stuff into a book and it just didn't want to be a book, um, I see it now and I see the, the potential of it and where it could go. Um, it's such a huge other world to, to delve into, but I, I do um, think it is on my radar, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and just learning about, again, like these structures of, of putting together these, these mecha the mechanics of things opening um, is, is fascinating because there's so much going on underneath that you don't see. Um, so I think kind of as I learn more about that, then it could definitely find its way in there somewhere. Mm. But uh, thank you, Laura, for asking. Okay, uh, Gail Mitchell uh, has a question. I, similar to the first question that I asked, or that was asked, excuse me. Um, but now looking more at your process, so asking uh, the question is, have you made any models for other works in site-specific spaces? And do you ever compare the model photographs with photo documentations of your actualized pieces? And how do you see the relationship between those two modalities? Um, sometimes I get confused when I'm looking through my documentation as to what was the real thing and what was the model. Um, of course, the models are, are much more sloppily made and you can kind of see the seams and tell that it was a marker that I made the floor out of. Um, but uh, sometimes they look exactly the same, which is kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, again, kind of goes back to how photographs function or how photography functions, how lenses function. Um, if it's a model and you're putting something in there and whatever device you're using to shoot it is shooting it in the same way as you would in a real space, then, then the device itself doesn't know the difference. Um, the lens doesn't know the difference. It's, the, it's, it's viewing it the same way, um, which uh, 
is yeah it's it's interesting and sometimes sometimes i think the, the models are more interesting than the actual piece turns out um yeah so i have a i'll insert my question okay. <laughs> and then we'll go back um but i'm really fascinated by the early interiors that felt very cinematic mm -hmm. um and also I mean, obviously the intimacy that's implied. Um, and I'm curious what has happened to that component of intimacy, or do you see also the way in which intimacy plays a role in scale in your exterior constructions? So I'm still processing it in my, because I actually have not seen those earlier photographs and I just found them to be extremely striking and very moving. Actually, now when we think about how much time we are spending <laughs> inside yeah. spaces now that I think it, it kind of carries that. But I'm curious what you see um, that level of intimacy or at least scale, human scale that's still carried forward in your external pieces of the exterior world. I think, um, I mean, A, the, the older work, looking back at it now, it's, it's gained a lot of meaning. Mm -hmm. um, at the time it was, you're in it and you, it's, you're just taking it and it's happening and it doesn't really feel like something. But I think, I think having that distance from it, it really turns it into something, um, something else than maybe it was at the time. And I, I think the translation in some ways into the work I make now is just the fact that like I shoot all of my photographs, um, they're all taken from the street. Like I'm never trying to get access to a view that you yourself couldn't just walk up and see. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's an important aspect of it that it's in my artist statement, I say pedestrian point of view. So it's, it's everybody and, and not um, something very uh, separated from our day-to-day -day experience of walking around. And I mean, that's part of what I uh, like to think I'm talking about in the work is this day-to-day this -day back and forth and the things that we miss and the stuff that's going on around us. And if we could just stop for a minute and look up and actually take it in, but we can't take it all in because it's so big and there's so much of it um, where we're so busy and we're hurrying somewhere um, that, that it's just, it can't really be gathered all at once. And so I think a little bit of it just is that it's, it's my, my translation of that experience of, of those spaces and, and neighborhoods or, or whatever it is that I'm photographing and that somebody else would do it completely differently or see something else that, mm -hmm. that I didn't see. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is, I think, maybe our last question. Um, and it's from Norma. Uh, so where do you see your work moving forward? Any new projects forthcoming? Um, yeah, actually, there, there's a whole part of my work that I didn't show because you have so much work, you can't show it all. But I, I make these tiny little collages that um, are, we call them relief collages because they're sort of photographs that are stacked on top of each other. And they, they create this sort of very flat space, but it's still sort of three dimensional. Um, it's, it's even hard to like show on the screen because you kind of have to see it in person. So one of the things that sort of happened again when we were in lockdown was I started working on those again, um, but in a different way. Those were, most of them were sort of these sort of random bits that I found on the street, but this is um, specifically about Midtown um, because Midtown is like this amazing museum of architecture, uh, 20th century architecture. I guess some of it's 21st, but, um, it, it's sort of like no other part of the city in the way that it's compact and you just have like everything is there um, no matter where you turn. So uh, 
they're they're again they're small they show these little intimate things as opposed to the giant sprawling stuff that i usually make and then they're they're um these these collaged kind of on top of each other relief things mm -hmm. so going that direction and then finishing this this book folded not book um, project which i still have to make a some sort of informational insert for and, and a few other things but that's yeah and will that be additioned yeah Okay. Yeah. Um, we're so, figuring that out. <laughs> yeah, but it's exciting because um, the thing is like when you make this big stuff, it's like who is your audience and who can take it home with them and how, to, how to, are you able to kind of consume it afterwards? Um, there's the internet, of course, but having, and I mean, you, you've made books, Leslie. It's just like nice that somebody somewhere far away who could never even see your show can have like a thing that, that represents it and can interact with it and um, get to know it a little bit better. So, um, yeah. So that was our, that, con that will conclude. Those are the, the questions that we have. Um, and I, really want to thank you, Jen, for your presentation. I didn't introduce myself at the beginning, but I'm Leslie Hewitt and I am Jen's colleague within the context of Cooper Union and also a fellow alumna. Um, and it's a real joy to work with you and also to, you know, see how, how your work is so kind of integrated into the location of, of New York, which I, I also feel that connection too. So thank, thank you. you. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Bye. Bye.